According to Clement of Alexandria, and according to Origen, and according to Gregory of Nyssa, the glimpse of the future that the hymn of Philippians 2 grants us is one of universal salvation. All will recognize the need for salvation and freely choose Christ as Lord. Each of these church fathers believed in a punishment that awaits unbelievers after death, but they also believed that the end result we can expect beyond every experience, including the experience of such punishment, is one of all things being reconciled to God. Moreover, Clement and Origen and Gregory were all Greek fathers, which means they wrote in Greek. When we read conventional commentators of the English translations of the Bible, they inevitably end up making the case that Philippians 2 just can't mean what it seems to mean at face value. They might admit that confession leads to salvation, but they're quick to dismiss such a notion in this case. Yet when we read these Greek fathers who understood the original language of the New Testament far better than most of our modern commentators, they make no such dismissal. To them, the hymn of Philippians 2 told the story of universal salvation through Christ, and they chose to celebrate this story and to share it in their writings. Amazing Grace, be thou my vision and all creatures of our God and King. Each of these hymns have been around for centuries, and believers from all around the world have found comfort and formed bonds of unity by singing them together. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs just stick with us easily and serve as powerful tools for retaining the truth and for sharing it with others. Scripture itself is filled with poetic and musical language. The most obvious examples can be found in the book of Psalms, where again and again we find at the beginning of a psalm clear instructions for how it should be set to music. Psalm 4 begins by saying, For the choir master, with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. And Psalm 5 begins with, For the choir master, to be accompanied by flutes, a psalm of David. But we find references to music or singing throughout the Old Testament, in Exodus 15, in Numbers 21, and in 1 Samuel 18, and so on. And of course, the New Testament has its share of musical and poetic forms as well, one of the most beautiful and well-known of these being Mary's Song of Praise, better known as the Magnificat, found in Luke 1. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. By remembering the songs of the saints and by joining them in praising our mighty God and Savior, we engage in worship, we form bonds of unity, and we commit to memory the timeless truths that are central to the Christian faith. And it is on the timeless truths recorded in one particular New Testament hymn that I'd like to focus today. If you've been a subscriber for any length of time, you'll recognize that we've covered this text before. But today I want to dive deeper into this passage than we ever have before, and also discuss how it was received by some of the earliest Christians. The passage is Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Paul is calling the Philippians to seek unity with one another, a unity exemplified by their having the same mind and the same love. In verse 5, he introduces plainly and specifically the mind and the love that he's referring to. Have this mind, he says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What follows in verses 5 through 11, therefore, is the mentality that we should carry with us as believers. It's the mentality built on the encouragement and comfort of Christ that should characterize our fellowship and cause it to flourish. Yet it's also at this point that the structure of Paul's writing changes. He not only introduces the mind that we should all share as believers, but introduces it in a different style of writing. The website Bible Gateway explains it this way. The short rhythmic lines fall into two parts, verses 6 through 8, where the subject of every verb is Christ, and verses 9 through 11, where the subject is God. The general pattern is thus of Christ's humiliation and then exaltation. More precise analyses propose a division into six three-line stanzas or into three stanzas. So we are not reading simple prose here, but a rhythmic style of writing. Paul is sharing a poem or a hymn that outlines the framework of the mind that all believers should share. Now in the first century, as always, writing something in poetic or musical form implies conclusively that something is important and that it is intended to be remembered and recited. We might write a simple note to someone and not care whether or not it will be remembered a year from now. But if we take the time to write something in a rhythmic form, or at least attempt to, we quickly realize that it's a very deliberate process and something that's charged with meaning and intentionality. Every word, from start to finish, is crucially important. And for Paul, every word here was important not only for the sake of the rhythmic structure, but also for the sake of the doctrine that he was trying to convey. Scholars debate whether Paul is the author of this short hymn or poem in Philippians 2, or whether he's simply sharing it. But I honestly don't think this matters too much. What matters is that for the Philippians, this part of Paul's message would have stood out like he'd soaked it with a highlighter. In the midst of all the prosaic surrounding language, he uses rhythmic language to call their attention to something special that they need to remember. I'm not going to dig any further into the musical or poetic form of this passage. The only thing we need to keep in mind in relation to this is that Paul is making a very important point. But we need to dig deeper in our examination of the wording and intent that the Apostle shares here. First, I think it's a shame that many people use this text to promote the idea that we should submit to one another in our fellowship and fail to highlight the fact that this text also conveys the point that we are supposed to serve one another by accepting a certain doctrine. Of course, we are supposed to submit to one another in love and in the service of Christ, but we are also supposed to submit to God and to one another by holding fast to the truth. Humility requires that we willingly serve one another by humbly and fiercely clinging to the standard of faith as it has been declared to us by the apostles. This hymn conveys the mentality that should characterize both our fellowship and our faith. To understand all this, let's take a closer look at the text. Have this mind among yourselves, Paul writes, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The first section of this text, which is comprised of verses 6 through 8, outlines the story of Christ's dissension 
for our sakes. God in Christ Jesus descended, emptied himself, became a servant, became a man, and humbled himself as a man by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. While my primary purpose today is to talk about the doctrinal implications of this text, it's impossible to just walk by the radical call of fellowship infused in Paul's message. He's telling the Philippians that believers ought to enter relationships with their fellow believers with the same kind of mentality that Christ had. Christ had every right not to humble himself. He had the prerogative to stay right where he was above all things. And yet he chose to set aside his rights and descend below all things for the sake of all things. In our pursuit of Christ and his kingdom, we are called to do nothing less than this. As Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 1, Since therefore Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. If we want to be followers of Jesus, our calling is fierce but simple. Jesus gave up his rights, so should we. He emptied himself, so should we. He became a servant, so should we. He humbled himself, so should we. He became obedient to the point of death, so should we. Following Christ isn't just about knowing the gospel. It's about living it out. And this is the first way that we look to the interest of others. But the second way we look to the interest of others is to keep the whole message of the gospel in view and to make it the centerpiece, the glue, and the foundation of our fellowship. All of our personal interests should be set aside if they interfere with the gospel's centrality in the life of the Christian community. All the preferential songs that we might like to sing should be drowned out by the music of Christ glorified. And the second part of the hymn of Philippians 2 demonstrates exactly what Christ's glorification will look like. Therefore, Paul continues, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. As a result of Christ's sacrificial work, he has now been exalted, and every part of his exaltation is critical to our understanding of the gospel. Just as we must understand and imitate his dissension, we must also understand his ascension and recognize that in him we are drawing nearer to his perfect kingdom. If we are to be of one mind as a body of believers, we must take all of this into view. So let's take a detailed look at the exaltation of Christ as Paul describes it. First, Christ is exalted by God by being granted the name that is above every name. The act of naming something is connected with creation and authority. When we bring children into the world, we name them and exercise authority over them. When an inventor creates something, he names his invention and has legal rights over it. Adam was given the responsibility of naming the newly created animals in Genesis 2. For Adam was given the task of exercising authority over the earth to fill it and subdue it. Likewise, the exaltation of the name of Christ and the subjection of every name under his is connected to the creation of a new covenant. As the new Adam, Jesus perfectly exercises authority over all things. And just as all the animals were brought to Adam to be named, all names will now be brought before Christ and will recognize his name. And this leads us to the next line of the hymn. Christ was granted the name above all others, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. It's important to recognize that the bowing of the knee in Scripture is universally a voluntary act of worship and reverence. I can't find a single case in which anyone is forced to bow the knee. There are a couple of occasions where you see enemies licking the dust off of the feet of those who rule over them, such as in Psalm 72 or Isaiah 49. But even in those contexts, these acts seem closely related to a willing service or take place as a result of the light spreading to the nations. So here in Philippians 2, when we read that every knee will bow, our first inclination should not be that everyone will be forced to bow to God. If we appreciate the overwhelming biblical meaning of such an act, 
we should recognize that the bowing of the knee is more likely a willing act of worship or reverence. In the next line, we find a description of the host that will engage in this volitional act of bowing the knee. Paul says that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Commentators agree that the intention here is to take all of creation into view. Every heavenly being, every earthly being, and every being now abiding under the earth, that is everything without exception, will bow the knee to Jesus. For the believer, this is good news. The kingdom of Christ is going to be fully realized. His lordship will be universally acknowledged. What can this result in but righteousness, joy, and peace? Yet for the unbeliever, this may seem at present to be an unwelcomed promise. Would God really have every being bow to Christ in the end? Well, yes, he would. In fact, he will. This is both a present command and a fixed expectation. As Paul says to the Athenians in Acts 17, 30 through 31, he, God, commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. From the very beginning, the Christian message has been an all-encompassing, universal message. The faith of the believer is a faith which recognizes the impact that Christ has and will have on all of creation. Next, we find that not only will every knee bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, but also that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We recognized a minute ago that the bowing of the knee is a willing act of worship or reverence, and here in verse 11, we have a clear confirmation that this is precisely what we are seeing. For Paul says not only that every knee will bow, but also that every tongue will confess. The word for confession here, regardless of where it is used in the New Testament, always involves someone freely and willingly aligning themselves with a higher authority. It can be an act of praise, a confession of sin, or a formal agreement. But it is never forced and never coerced. The scriptural basis for this hymn, as most of you probably already know, is Isaiah 45. The Hebrew word there, which is replaced with confession in the New Testament hymn, actually denotes a swearing of allegiance. So when we envision all the hosts of heaven and of earth and of all those under the earth kneeling before God and confessing that Jesus is Lord, we shouldn't have in mind a crowd in which some beings are chained down or forced to acknowledge Christ. Rather, we should envision every individual being offering Christ their praise their service, and their commitment willingly. Paul appropriately concludes the hymn by stating that Christ's exaltation will result in the glory of God the Father. As is clearly demonstrated in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, Christ's authority comes from the Father. The Father gave Christ the name that is above every name, and the Father exalted Christ, and as the result of Christ's exaltation, the Father is glorified. An emphasis on the Father's glory was a central component of Paul's eschatology. We see it also in 1 Corinthians 15.25, where he says that when all things are subjected to him, Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Ultimately, then, God's intention through God the Son is to penetrate all creation, uniting everything with a recognition of his glory. At this point, I'd like to consider the responses of some of the early church fathers to this text. But before we do that, let's briefly recap our discussion so far and take one more glance at the text as a whole. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
As we've stated, Paul wants his audience to humble themselves in their fellowship with one another and in their faith in the gospel. And to this end, he delineates the mind or the thinking that they should embrace. This thinking involves embracing the humility that Christ modeled in his early life, the emptying of the self, the laying down of personal rights, the offering of service, and the willingness to be obedient, even to the point of death. But this thinking also involves recognizing Christ's exaltation, acknowledging that his name is above every name, and that at his name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Notice the force of Paul's repetitive language here. He says that Christ's name is above every name, that every knee will bow, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He doesn't leave room for confusion. In saying that Christ's name is above every name, he clearly means that there is nothing outside his authority save the Father. Likewise, then, there can be nothing outside the scope of our vision when we read that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The term every is defined as everything that exists under Christ, and this same every will kneel and confess that he is Lord. And as we have seen, this kneeling and confessing constitutes a willing act of reverence and worship, which includes a freely granted swearing of allegiance to Christ. Of course, teachers who hold to the notion that eternal punishment is synonymous with unending conscious torment cannot accept that the confession and worship of Christ, as described in Philippians 2, results in the salvation of the worshipers. Thus, they deliberately dismiss the force and language of the text. Barnes writes, for example, But this does not mean that they will all be saved, for the guilty and the lost may be compelled to acknowledge his power and submit to his decree as the sovereign of the universe. There is a free and cheerful homage of the heart which they who worship him in heaven will render, and there is a constrained homage which they must yield who are compelled to acknowledge his authority. So even conventional commentators like Barnes agree that the acknowledgement of Christ is universal, but they contend that for the guilty and the lost, this will be a compelled acknowledgement and a constrained homage. But as we've seen in today's study, the conventional interpretation just does not line up with the text or with the rest of Scripture. Biblically, bowing and confessing simply aren't acts of compulsion or constrained homage. On the contrary, they are freely offered acts of worship or reverence, acts of a lesser authority aligning itself willingly with a higher authority. But a universalistic interpretation of the hymn in Philippians 2 isn't new. Many church fathers came to the same conclusion. So let's consider what they had to say. In his commentary on 1 John chapter 2, Clement of Alexandria references Philippians chapter 2 as it shapes his understanding of how Christ has become the propitiation not only for the sins of believers, but also for the sins of the whole world. Clement writes, And not only for our sins, that is, for those of the faithful, is the Lord the propitiator, does he, John, say, but also for the whole world. He indeed saves all, but some he saves converting them by punishments. Others, however, who follow voluntarily, he saves with dignity of honor, so that every knee should bow to him of all things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, that is, angels, men, and the souls that before his advent have departed from this temporal life. We also find Origen referencing Philippians chapter 2 when he speaks of the omnipotence of the Father and the Son. Through wisdom, which is Christ, God has power over all things, not only by the authority of a ruler, but also by the voluntary obedience of subjects. Now if all things, which are the Father's, are also Christ's, certainly among those things which exist is the omnipotence of the Father, and doubtless the only begotten Son ought to be omnipotent, that the Son also may have all things which the Father possesses. And I am glorified in them, he declares. For at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, 
and every tongue shall confess that the Lord Jesus is in the glory of God the Father. And if every knee is bent to Jesus, then without doubt it is Jesus to whom all things are subject, and he it is who exercises power over all things, and through whom all things are subject to the Father. For through wisdom, i.e., by word and reason, not by force and necessity, are all things subject. And therefore his glory consists in this very thing, that he possesses all things. And this is the purest and most limpid glory of omnipotence, that by reason and wisdom, not by force or necessity, all things are subject. And in the midst of defending the doctrine of the Trinity, Gregory of Nyssa quotes the hymn of Philippians 2 several times. Let's consider two examples where he highlights the salvific implications of this text. He writes, For this cause it is that at the name of Jesus every knee bows of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. For assuredly every knee would not thus bow did it not recognize in Christ him who rules for its own salvation. And later he writes, He, the Apostle Paul, speaks of the subjection of all men to God, when we all, being united to one another by the faith, become one body of the Lord who is in all, as the subjection of the Son to the Father, when the adoration paid to the Son by all things with one accord, by things in heaven, and things on earth, and things under the earth, redounds to the glory of the Father. As Paul says elsewhere, to him every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For when this takes place, the mighty wisdom of Paul affirms that the Son, who is in all, is subject to the Father by virtue of the subjection of those in whom he is. For the subjection of men to God is salvation for those who are so made subject, according to the voice of the prophet, who says that his soul is subject to God, since of him comes salvation by subjection, so that subjection is the means of averting perdition. As therefore the help of the healing art is sought eagerly by the sick, so is subjection by those who are in need of salvation. So according to Clement of Alexandria, and according to Origen, and according to Gregory of Nyssa, the glimpse of the future that the hymn of Philippians 2 grants us is one of universal salvation. All will recognize the need for salvation and freely choose Christ as Lord. Each of these church fathers believed in a punishment that awaits unbelievers after death, but they also believed that the end result we can expect beyond every experience, including the experience of such punishment, is one of all things being reconciled to God. Moreover, Clement and Origen and Gregory were all Greek fathers, which means they wrote in Greek. When we read conventional commentators of the English translations of the Bible, they inevitably end up making the case that Philippians 2 just can't mean what it seems to mean at face value. They might admit that confession leads to salvation, but they're quick to dismiss such a notion in this case. Yet when we read these Greek fathers who understood the original language of the New Testament far better than most of our modern commentators, they make no such dismissal. To them, the hymn of Philippians 2 told the story of universal salvation through Christ, and they chose to celebrate this story and to share it in their writings. But what do you think? Do you think Philippians chapter 2 paints a picture of universal salvation? Will all be saved through Christ? Or is there a valid reason that we should dismiss such an idea in this text. I'd love to hear your take on this, so leave comments and let me know your thoughts. But don't forget to like, subscribe, and even share the video if you liked it. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.